So today we are joined by an incredible entrepreneur. He's a business owner to a variety of different ventures from ice cream shops to farms. He's an author, public speaker, content creator, coach, and much, much more. Our guest today excels in the world of business, and I'm looking forward to him sharing his pearls of wisdom with us today. It's James Sinclair. How are you, James? Hello. Nice to be with you, Jack. No worries. It's, it's good to be with you. So thank you for, for coming on the podcast. So start the way we always do. Who are you and what problem do you solve? Oh, my God. Uh, I think I solve lots of problems. Uh, I'm a business owner. Um, I own a chain of day nurseries, a um, couple of farm attractions. Uh, we've got a food services business. We make ice cream. We own one of the oldest ice cream companies in the country. We make teddy bears and arts and crafts for kids. Um, that, you know, We employ a 1,000 people. Uh, we've been going nearly two decades now. Um, and uh, we love what we do, and, uh, and I'm very passionate about helping entrepreneurs and business owners grow their business, and I make loads of content um, uh, on YouTube and my podcast. I wrote some books, um, and that's just a brief summary of uh, the repertoire of stuff I get up to. Beautiful. So not only are you coaching entrepreneurs on their journey, we're looking at problems you solve. It could be five-year-old little Sally that's walking in and getting an ice cream and walking out with a teddy. So. There's a, a range of demographics there in terms of the problems you solve. Okay, so how did you get started? Obviously, it's, it's probably been a bit of a journey. Yeah, I started when I was like 15 doing kids' parties. I was a kids' entertainer, magician. Um, I built an entertainment business up um, as a sole trader, if you like, swapping time for money, but I was getting good money for that time. Um, and I took that money and started buying buy-to-let properties um, and invested into building an entertainment agency um, and doing prop hire and bouncy castle hire. Um, and I just realized I had a me too business. Um, and so then I scaled up and opened my own venues. Then we went into the, the animal adventure parks and the, um, the day nurseries and the, the bigger businesses from there on. Had you always been entrepreneur or was there like a, a switch that where that happened? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I was definitely the kid selling sweets at school, uh, yeah, I, I've I've always had an eye for business and entrepreneurship, but only really in the sectors that I'm most interested in. So I'm really interested in making great content. Um, I'm really interested in entertainment and hospitality, leisure and uh, stuff around the family space and, and commercial property. I like all of that. Um, so as long as I, it fires my passion up and it's a good business model, um, then, uh, then, then I want to get involved, yeah, and I want to do more. Okay. And you, you said there, me too. So I know what you mean by that because I've watched a lot of your content. What, for the people that might be listening that don't know, what, what does that mean? What low barrier to entry me too businesses are probably where lots of people start on their entrepreneurial journey. But you want to get out of it um, because you want some higher barrier to entry stuff around you to protect you so that if you're having a, a period of uh, relaxation if you like if you're going away for fortnight you don't have to worry about the market swallowing you up now what do i mean by that let's give a a real example so a me too business would have been my first business a family entertainment bouncy castle hire business you know anyone with five thousand pounds can set up and be in competition with us they might not be as good as us but they will take a slice of the pie and that i just thought well if i open my own venues i've got my own locations where you need half a million to set it up it's less me too it's more me it's still me too it's still low barrier to entry and then i think well if i open a theme park i need 20 million pounds i need planning permission i need uh you know stuff that makes it difficult for people to set up in competition with you so i've always liked the idea of trying to build my business to be as high barrier to entry as possible that's why i like regulated businesses why i got into childcare because ofsted regulation scares people about getting involved in a market and i like all that now i like regulated businesses because they protect you from being so me too so that hopefully i've given a good explanation of it that was a brilliant so you see where you see the problems that other people might see and they run away and then you run towards them like a, a cow in the storm, it sounds like. As long as it's in the sector that vertically integrates the rest of our business. Yeah, We're big people's, uh, well, I call it folding into existing empire. We don't just go off and set up stuff that 
one of our existing businesses cannot be served or serve the other thing that we're going to buy. So we bought the Rossi Ice Cream Company. We were spending a quarter of a million pounds a year on ice cream. We now keep that revenue within the business, that cash flow stays within the business, um, and we can give Rossi more revenue um, and pass it on and build it around other businesses on the back of our existing business. Um, and so we always want to make sure that vertical integration is part of what we do. Interesting. So there's a, a lot of logical decisions in the background. It's not just, right, okay, you've not woke up one day and said, I'm going to go and buy an ice cream shop. Um, okay, so you, you started off as an entertainer. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really interested in this. So how did you enhance your sales skills? And, and maybe what crossover have you seen from your skills in maybe performing to selling? Is, is there any? I think if you are confident and passionate about products and can stand up in front of people and convey a message, then you're always going to be able to sell ideas and products and services. Um, I've always, you know, if you look at all my businesses, all stuff that I'm really interested in. So um, it's very easy to sell stuff that you're passionate about. Um, but, you know, I think all entrepreneurs and business owners, you know, one of the, the top skills for them to stay in the game is to be good at selling and conveying a message. You know, mm. only 5% of businesses make it past being 10 years old. So I think that's a, one of the skill sets of the successful is being able to sell. And, and what did you do? Because it, obviously we work in sales and a lot of the people that listen to this podcast are people that might be new to sales roles or sales leaders. So what did you do specifically to enhance those skills and, and get better? Or was it a bit of a natural talent? Um, I was, I'm was. i a confident chap. I think that I have no problem standing in front of people and talking and speaking. Once you've got the confidence and then you, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's and finesse the skill set over a period of time. But, I mean, I, you know, I'm very happy to sell the products and services of the businesses that I'm passionate about. Um, you know, and... And I've always understood that if there was a gap in the market and we can do it better, why wouldn't someone buy from us? We're better than uh, than our competitors. So come and come and check us out, and I convey that message hopefully quite quite um, quite well. Um, personally, I mean, I'm I'm an okay salesperson, but I, I think probably I'm a better marketeer. And I think if you're really good at marketing, especially content marketing, your sales become very easy. Um, and that's why I spend a lot of time on writing books, doing podcasts, making videos, because that gets more people to know about us and then they're predetermined. And this is what makes sales very easy, in my opinion, is when you've got predetermination. So people wanting to buy a pair of Nikes, they are going into the shop predetermined to buy Nikes over Adidas, over New Balance or whatever it is, that, that predetermination's in their mindset. And then you're really just assisting the sale to be made if you're working in that shop. <laughs> In terms of being a, a salesperson from a cold audience, I just I think that's very difficult, and I know there are people that do that well. Um, it's just I just think you, you just have a much better life by doing really good marketing, and you know showing what pain you can solve, and then getting those people over the line into a customer. It's just such a better way of doing things. And no, I agree. It selling from cold is is very hard that's predominantly what we do we we focus on cold calling in the in the same way in the same way that i cold called you out the blue to get you on this podcast it, it is a hard game i think if you can learn some of the skills that come with it one of the the biggest skills i think when it comes to uh, especially selling cold is is mindset so you've obviously got a very strong mindset to have built what you built but with the economy, the risk of entrepreneurship and the highs and lows of sales and business, what, what have you done over time and what do you do to make sure that you've always got the strongest mindset possible? Do you know, uh, to, to have a strong mindset in business, you want to make sure the fundamentals of your business is strong so that your mind doesn't panic. You know, it's very hard, you know, that... It, the odds are stacked against you. The facts don't lie. The data doesn't lie. Most people fail in business. The people that succeed in business, yeah, they have a positive mindset, but they're passionate about the thing they do and they have a good business model. And if you look at the model of a business, is one that has a hungry audience that are ready to buy straight away. 
And if you've got a hungry audience that are ready to buy straight away, it's much easier to have a positive mindset because you've got customers that will, that want to do, they want to transact, they want to buy from you. And if you keep getting the sales coming in, it's very easy then to continue to have that positive mindset. No sales, no cash flow. My God, you're going to get a negative mindset very quickly. So you want to choose a really good um, <coughs> model that has a volume of sales, hungry audience, there's volume in it, there's margin in it. If you've got good margin in your business, you're allowed to invest in research and development, invest in good team, invest in your customers by what I call customer cuddles, be able to reward, surprise and delight your customers like Disney do, like Apple do, like if you travel first class or upper class, you see, and they're giving you all these customer cuddles all the time, creating huge brand loyalty. It's so much more enjoyable to be in that space than in the scale and commoditized space. I think a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners try and do commoditized businesses and compete with supermarkets and the likes of Amazon that have got huge deep pockets. Um, and I always think that SME business owners that are generating up to £50 million worth of revenue should be in the experience margin-led space so that they... Um, that they can weather storms and they've got good strong enough margin to be able to reinvest back into their business and actually pay themselves i think a lot of business owners um, pay themselves hardly anything and just put hours and hours into a business because the model isn't there they're passionate about it but the model is just flawed and therefore they don't have profitability on their side which means that their mindset is just shrunk so we've got to have volume we've got to have margin we've got to be able to be in a business where we can control overhead um, if you my business to a degree that's quite difficult now you know we have a sometimes a million pound payroll a month so we've got to make sure that we've continually got cash coming in but one of the things that our business does have is this is another way of keeping your mindset good if you think volume of sales hungry audience but also businesses where people transact with you four times in quick succession is some of the strongest types of businesses that i've come across so if you think about a supermarket most people are quite habitual to the supermarkets they use they go to the supermarket on a monday Monday, then they go on the Wednesday and they might go in on the Saturday then the next Tuesday they go in there very regular like your local corner shop you go there four times in quick succession creating habits therefore you're very loyal to that business and less fickle think about hospitality and leisure and the, the businesses that I trade through people don't go to the zoo four times in two weeks they just don't do it so you're always competing with other hospitality and leisure that are competing for that pound that's why I like childcare you come to us on a Monday see you on Tuesday see on Wednesday, see you on Thursday, building rapport with the customer, building habits with the customer, um, therefore it becomes uh, a really strong and lovely business, like an insurance brokerage or like your mortgage provider, you're paying your mortgage payment each month, therefore you don't just change banks on, on a whim, you don't just change doctors or you don't just change Netflix on a whim, you're using it four times in quick succession, creating habits, then loyalty. Um, and because of those things, you always have a positive mindset about your business because predictable cash flow um, is what keeps you sane and keeps your head above water and therefore keeping you have a positive mindset. If you start from zero each month, it becomes very difficult. I agree. No, knowing that it's going to be all right. It, it's like that thing when they talk about building a house, like you've got the confidence because if the, if the cash flow is there and like you, you're constantly bringing in sales, it's like, well, I know that this is repeatable. Obviously, I can keep a positive mindset because the, the, the facts are there. I call it the evidence shelf. So it's like, right, OK, this is something that's happened over the last 12 months, every month. And it's always okay, so I'm going to put it on that evidence shelf. So next time a little bit of worry or a niggle might slip in, okay, well then I'm, I'm going to take that off the shelf and say, well, actually, there's nothing to be worried about. Yeah. So we, we work in sales, so we regularly talk about kind of the revenue-driving activity. So rather than filling your diary with pointless menial tasks, so when you first started, what, what were some of the most important revenue-driving tasks and how do you avoid getting bogged down by the, the stuff that doesn't really matter? I've never got involved in that. I employed a PA when I was 17 years old. And that was it, bang. Anything menial, it's off the table. Just will not do it. I spend 80% of my time on revenue generating tasks, always have. Yep, never done it. So I, I just can't really comment because, you know, I saw that I was doing low value tasks on day one, day two, get someone to do your admin, boom, done. So... I know that you, you did a piece of content about this. So why do most people fail with that then? So why are people like 
worrying about that and, and doing well, that and trying to do everything. Because people are scared of employing people. They're scared of having the commitment of the salaries. Why do people want to be employed? Is because there's an insurance policy there that you're going to get paid every single month, and that makes you feel safe and comforted. Entrepreneurs are a strange bunch, especially the the super successful ones. They they think very differently to most, and I'm not saying that's right. You know, I I do think I'm a little bit weird. You know, yeah, I'm very happy to personally guarantee millions of pounds, put my house on the line, um, give security. I'm very happy to do any of that sort of stuff. Not everyone is. But it's the risk and rewards. You've taken the risks over your career and the rewards have, have reaped in. So speaking on that... I just think, and, and kind of- I think it's a risk not to employ people. I think it's stupid to um, outsource everything. I think it's stupid to not you know, use contractors because when you come to retirement and you're going to sell your business... Are you trying to sell a profitable job or a profitable business? And you want to build a, you know, we're not, if I go and buy a business, I want to meet the management team and the team. And if the team and the management team isn't there, I devalue it. I don't want to buy it. I'm thinking, trust, I'm just buying a job here. I want to buy the employees. I want to buy the infrastructure. I want to buy all of that. And most people do everything they can to avoid that. Um, and then they're not building an investment. And all of the, the big sales and the big businesses that are bought and sold is because of the strength of the management team that has been built it is the most mm. valuable asset of a business if it's all outsourced it's a bit naff isn't it yeah i yeah i tend to to agree obviously you want to grow something that, that you can actually say well this is mine and then get to a point where you can step away go on holiday for two weeks and then wh- whatever well, it is no, the, and then the, the primary focus is you should be building a business to sell even if you have no intention of selling it because that discipline mm. makes you build something better yeah, I agree. So looking at your, I know that you referred to yourself there as a little bit weird. So what other attributes do you think that you have that you might have seen in other entrepreneurs that that might stick out, that, that is kind of against the norm and, and not the normal person? Um, in master delegators, you know, usually entrepreneurs are very good at getting rid of tasks um, taking calculated risks, um, good relationships with people and understanding that they're happy to employ people that are better than them at stuff. A lot of people struggle with that. Mm-hmm. Um, great entrepreneurs usually are prepared to be living a very frugal lifestyle for years and years while the business and the employees earn more. A lot of people can't cope with that. You know, they can't cope that they might be paying someone instead of themselves for a good amount of years. Um, and I've done that. And I, I, know, I know a lot of people would struggle with that mindset. Like the employees are earning more than you. You know, and you're taking all the loans on and you're doing all the risk and yeah. You know, leaders eat last, in my opinion, um, and a lot of people have a, you know, have a mental block with that um, because, I, you know, I'm not building a profitable job. You know, I'm building a, you know, I, you go through the three stages: solopreneur, entrepreneur, investorpreneur. If you are a super successful entrepreneur, you're building an investment that someone else wants to buy, um, and so I just see as our employees as great investments in the business. Um, and, and these are all strange things to think because, you, you know, you might have 75 Christmases and 75 summers in your lifetime and, you know, you, you're you're carving out a big chunk of that to build a business that rather than fulfil your own lifestyle and, you know, you put a lot of hours in and you're able to cope with big stresses because it's, it's hard. It's very hard, you know, funding everything, especially if you're in businesses like mine, capital-intensive businesses, buying carousels and dinosaur parks and building day nurseries and big properties and taking millions of pounds worth of loans not for everyone um, and no, so but I, that, that, that makes you strange because it's not I'm not so you know that is unusual it is you said something there like obviously about the the 75 summers and 75 Christmases I don't know if you can see it. I've got a, a massive memento more sign above my head which means remember you'll die and I think it's I always talk about death and I'm a a big lover of kind of talking about mortality because it's 
you kind of said it there, it will take a big chunk of your life, but when you've sat on that deathbed, I think it's more of a case of like, well, do, do I set up this or do I not? Do I take that risk or do I not? But actually, one day you won't get to make a choice. So it's not about what, what the answer is. It's, it's, it's kind of like one day there won't be any That's questions think, to know, ask. You know, for me, is I really genuinely believe that you spend most of your time with the people you work with. So regardless... You know, I think about my life, I could just own commercial property and make a lot of money and have no stress. I know how to do it, but I love the people I work with and uh, you know, I enjoy seeing them and, uh, and I like the thought of building something, I'm driven by the thought of creating and doing um, uh, and that, that, that drives me and uh, you know, I like building ice cream factories and you know, making it possible. It's, um, you know, that's important to me. And these are all, you know, rather than having 10 fancy cars and more holidays and, you know, I'm not being my family and stuff, but I just, I want to be fulfilled in what I'm doing. I want to be hungry that I'm making a difference. And these are all traits of entrepreneurial people that I've met. They're just the super successful ones. A very thick skinned and have hyper focus on the things that really matter and don't mess around wasting time on stuff that doesn't interest them they have brains that work faster than normal in, in, in many ways you know, they're on to the next subject and they're building teams around them to look after the detail but they might look at the micro detail it's very strange you know very strange set of people that are very successful that I've come across. And, and do you think there'll be a time where you get to a point where you say, I've done enough now, that's enough for me? No. No, I, I'm thinking about a friend of mine who's 65 and another one that's 73. They're carrying on like there's no tomorrow. If they're seriously entrepreneurial people, you know, why is Richard Branson doing space tourism at 76 years old or whatever he is? Not doing it to make any more money. He's just a very driven individual. Um, and he, you know, he needs that that drive. And um, I, I just want to keep going. As long as I'm enjoying it. If I, if I feel like I've lost my hunger for something, then we might come out certain sectors. But, you know, what? I've got a brain that's highly active and I have to do stuff. Mm, to satisfy well we've, we've kind of stumbled into this quite nicely so I, I want to talk about hunger so I want to hit you with a two part question so in one of your videos you talk about hunger and procrastination so why do you think people don't get things done and don't have that hunger and, and where does your hunger come from um, I think being more Good entrepreneurial people, you know, they're quite ego-driven and, and there is something in their DNA that drives them, whether it's past childhood. They're just wired up a bit differently. There's something about them. Why do people procrastinate? Why do some people not? Just great entrepreneurs are very vision-led like them. Don't really see the challenges because they are thinking faster than normal and they it's really interesting why do people procrastinate I don't know why people <laughs> environment has a big part to play if they're surrounded by positive people that are driving them forward I think if you don't have that but then I know people that are in a terrible environment and they've got out of it and then they've just gone to the moon. Uh, but I definitely think you've got to, you know, you become the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. So if you're surrounded by great people, there's a good chance that you're going to become greater. If you're surrounded by mood hoovers, there's a good chance you'll be a mood hoover. But entrepreneurs get out of bad environments. The, the ones that I meet, you know, weren't particularly, I left home very young. I wasn't particularly happy with that environment. So I got out and was on my own. 
Cause, mm. Yeah, I, th- I think you said it there, like the, the people you spend... Because I'll be f- with kind of acquaintances and things like, come on, like you can you can do anything. You've got this one life. Why don't you kind of get up? So maybe it's fear. Well, it's, it's lack of hunger. You know, if you... You've got to be hungry for the thing that you're doing. And if that hunger's not there, then procrastination will set in. So you spoke about like environment and childhood and, and all these different things. At what, at what point did you realize that you had that hunger? Where, where did that come from? What, where's the, the James that we know now? Who is, who's he and, and why? Um, I don't know why I'm like I am. I just, you know, I suppose a lot, I lost my mum very young and I had to get out and do what I needed to do and, um, build something I'm very driven um, I suppose I want to prove that I can do it um, I want to do the impossible not the possible um, I want to be building so that I've got security uh, for myself and for my family although I'm probably well past that stage now why do I do it? I just there's something inside me that drives me more than most. You know, it's, it's a like I say. I, th- I think I'm wired up differently, and I, you know, I don't need to do more, but I feel like I haven't done enough. You know, I, but from the outside, I think a lot of people look and go, right? He's, you know, he's got a business that does thirty million in sales a year. He's got millions of pounds worth of properties. He's built multiple businesses and I just feel like I haven't even scratched the surface and I'm disappointed in what I've achieved so far, even now. That's really interesting because you said there, like you said there, disappointed in what you've done and you want to prove it, but you've, from an outsider's point of view, like the accolades and the, the success and the achievement is, is it's incredible. So it's like the the proof is in the pudding you've, from from an outsider's point of view you've done it so I, I guess it goes back to that thing because it's it's that battle with entrepreneurs that they're constantly wanting more so it's like when do you think when do you think the proof will be will be there where you won't be disappointed in what you've done um, I don't think it'll ever be there I think it'll be like it till I'm done Are you happy? Yeah. Overall, yes. Yeah, I'm, I've got an amazing children, amazing team. I love my businesses. Um, yeah, overall, I'm, I am have the bad days. I might have, you know, someone do us over. Or, but overall, yeah, I'm, I love what I do. I just, you know, think I'm, you know, I haven't done enough. I think I could have, you know, had a lot more and done a lot more and, and I'm just, just the way I am, really. I maybe I've should have taken a few more risks, which I think most people <laughs> more, <laughs> more <laughs> risks. Yeah, I think I could have, you know, calculated, not not enough, you know, good stuff, you know. Oh, I think why couldn't I have made that happen? Why could I have not got that over the line? Um, you know, why it's my YouTube channel not got a million subscribers? It's only got twenty five thousand. You know, why? Can I not make better videos? Why, um, why can I have not got that over the line? Done that? You know, it's difficult, you know. And and, and one of my downfalls is, you know, I'm, I suppose I'm, a bit obsessed with control and ownership. Although I'm very good at delegating, I've never wanted venture capitalists and shareholders, and so that's probably slowed me down a bit because I could have gone into London and got millions of pounds worth of VC funding to you know, catapult the size of my business, but I like doing it all with my own cash and bank debt, and th- that's much slower to grow. Mm. What do you, looking back on everything that you've done so far, what what do you think is the biggest mistake you've made? Um, no barrier to entry businesses for too long, holding on to things that I can't scale. Um... I don't really feel like I've made 
huge errors and the errors that I have made have helped me formulate a formula to not make sure like I own a set up a stretch limousine company stupid idea couldn't <laughs> scan it I had a um, a couple of um, party shops you know people only buy from you once a year you know I've learned all these things um, sometimes when I've slightly gone out of my lane but I've never had anything that's pulled me right down um, sometimes I, I'd done a business deal with someone recently last year and uh, I had a feeling that they were a bit of a shady character and it's come out that they was and I shouldn't have done it and I should have listened to my gut instinct but again it hasn't it's just made me you know lose my lunch but not lose my house you know so um, but I want to take some of those you know risks that you know that keeps me sane and doesn't think that I'm a superhero that just succeeds at everything I agree and one of the biggest things is it's so funny that your gut's telling you that and then you you still choose to go against it and it's it's like what 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 made you I guess go against your gut at that position because I wanted to buy the business I wanted to do the deal because it, it would it made a right fit for us um um I just had a feeling that this might yeah, I just had a feeling, you know, and it wasn't a strongish feeling. And I've had those feelings before and I've been proved wrong. So, you know, this isn't, a, you know, direct data and science, you know. I thought, oh, I'm not sure about this. And I've got it over the line and it was it was one of the best things I've ever done, you know. So that that's just life, isn't it? You know, you're not right all the time. Yeah, risk and reward. Okay. And before you were kind of 80 years old, although I, d I don't see you, slowing down anytime soon and sitting on a yacht and just looking back but say say we fast forward to the future and you've got 24 hours left and you look back on your time now from recording this podcast to the rest of the the rest of your life what what, what more do you want to achieve um want my children to like me and think that i've done a good job with them that would be up there I want to make great human beings, um, and I want my, want Natalie, my partner, to think, oh yeah, this was we had a good family as much as um, I built all this successful business stuff. You know what I love about my businesses is, on the whole, they are businesses that make people smile and happy and make a difference. Our childcare businesses literally help kids with the first steps of their lives. People that come to our ice cream parlour literally are multi-generational families having a laugh and a joke people that come to marsh farm for great days out and building family memories people that buy our teddy bears that have made them and kids are taking them to bed and cuddling them with a night um people that buy our arts and crafts and our slime making kits are you know creative people that watch our shows or come to our father christmas experience are making lifelong memories um and that i'm very very happy about that's a, a very lovely answer, James. Not once during this, this podcast have you come across as like flashy or in it for the, the money or the kind of even less so the accolade. It's more you you are making a difference. And from your answer there, you're making a difference in, in your own pool with your own family. Like that was the first answer. But then also it's it's the rippling effect. And I'm, I'm a big lover of this because what you what you're creating is children will look back in 50 100 years time and they'll look back on their first memory and that will be sat in an ice cream shop eating strawberry ice cream or, or whatever and, and and these memories that you will have had some impact and, and some effect there um beautiful i i think that's a a really lovely place to to leave it james thank you for thanks for having being me, so honest and and open about it and I think you, I, I look up to you. I think that you, you do some amazing things in the space. And for a lot of people that listen that are entrepreneurs or wanting to, to make that step, I think it is inspirational. So for anybody that's listening to this, obviously, if they want to go to one of your farms, I'm sure they'll be able to find it on your website. But if they want to work with you and get better, where should they go and what should they do? Watch me on YouTube, listen to my podcast, buy my books. I mean, they're all free if you really like listening to the podcasts and watching the youtube videos they're very two different styles of content um 
the, the YouTube videos of me like running my businesses and we like do a little docu series of me running everything. The podcast is me coaching business owners on how I would grow their business and I've done like two hundred and fifty episodes of that now. I think we've made nearly seven hundred YouTube videos. Um <clears throat> And if you really like that stuff and you want to learn more, then I run a few seminars throughout the year. They're only a couple of hundred quid a ticket. Um, and uh, I run them in London and um, at, at my hotel. Um, so, um, you know, they're the things that I do. Uh, but really, you can do it all for free. Just listen to the podcast and watch the YouTube channel. James Sinclair, poof, I shall appear. <laughs> Very inspirational. Well, keep going, James. I'm, I'm excited to watch your journey continue. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Cheers.